hello, welcome to Mardic 2. This is a Flash game from 2007. Uh, it's been about 15 years since this game came out. Uh, as a result, uh, in the intervening years, Flash has died, and you can only play this game on an emulator. Um, there'll be a link in the description, but I am playing this game inside of Adobe's official Flash emulator, uh, which is not terrible. It's a little faster than running this game inside a web browser, which is really nice. Alright, let's get right into it. So we're here in this cave, and the first thing I'm going to do, uh, after a little bit of walking, is equip a couple of reactions. This is a special thing in this game? I don't know. Um, there are these additional bonus abilities that help in combat. So you'll get in combat these little timing bars here, say react. Um, and when you hit the reaction, it's a four frame window at 30 FPS, it's very easy to do, um, you have some bonus effect. In this case, Mardek has two reactions. One of them is minus 20% damage and one of them is minus 10% because he has armor and a shield. Dugan only gets minus 20% because he only has armor. Um, and these reactions, as I say, they, they have an effect. So um, in this case, they'll help sort of extend Mardek and Dugan's health uh, for this early in the game. Uh, additionally, I equipped to them a pair of attack reactions. Um, these reactions, you'll see in a little bit, deal similarly bonus damage. They're plus 20% bonus damage. And those attack reactions, um, combined with Dugan's special ability here, uh, it's called Spellbladery, and it's the power attack, um, are going to help me finish this fight really quickly. Um, we're completely base level here. I haven't done any grinding. Uh, but with a with one of Dugan's power attacks, with the 20% damage buff, and then uh, one of Marduk's standard attacks, you can take out a bandit in one round. Um, and that's really critical for fitting, finishing this fight quickly. Now, unfortunately, Dugan's power attack only has a 75% hit rate. So it does miss sometimes. As long as it's reasonably late in the fight, it doesn't cost too much time, because it's only a couple of enemies. And whenever he misses, I can take the opportunity to heal to make up for, essentially, the extra damage we're going to take. Um... You'll notice that some of the time here with Mardek, I'm just mashing through the attack. That's because if Dugan gets the character to, I think it's 17 health or less, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what Mardek's damage range is, he's always going to get the kill. And it's faster to just mash X, which is select basic attack, target character, and then do the attack, rather than to try and make sure I hit it exactly twice, and then time the attack reaction. Just maybe a frame or two. Okay. Four blokes down. That's the mini boss, basically, of this area. And now we're going to make our way over to the boss, which is the whole reason we were sent to this cave. There's bandits in the cave. Find the bandit leader and take him out. Uh, first, we run up against another mini boss fight. This is. Uh, I guess we're not quite there yet. Um, we'll get there in a bit. Random encounter, as I say. It's an RPG. What do you expect? Um, down here is Goat. Gope is the bandit who ran away from the earlier fight. We say we don't want to fight him, and we don't have to fight him. Coming up here, I'm going to go for a trick um, that's a, a cutscene skip. So I hold Z and I mash X, and you can see Steel here walks in off screen through another character. Marianne's flash is red. Everything goes really fast there, and that's because that broke the cutscene. It saves about six seconds. And now we're in the Marianne's fight. Um, this is a really big reset point, because Marianne's has a potion that he can use, it's called a mugwort juice, and it heals him for 500 health. Uh, as you might guess, that means he essentially has double the base health, and therefore the fight takes an extra 30 seconds. Uh, Record did not get the quick kill, my PB did, hence the time delta in the splits. Um, to get this, you have to get the quick kill, you have to get him down to over 170 health. Uh, 170 is his heal threshold, 223 is a little high, um, and then you'll go Emila, Steel, and Dugan to try and deal enough damage to kill him before he gets his turn again. I got it here. Saves a bunch of time. And one of the reasons why I don't like resetting too much on four blokes, because Steel's punch there uh, has an 80% hit rate, which is pretty good, but does miss sometimes, and then you just have to reset or lose 30 seconds. So... All that done, we go meet the king. Uh, he tells us we're now the royal guard. And we're kind of like, that was easy. We just killed one guy. Okay. Um, but this is what we were striving for. And now we're going to go to sleep. 
this is how we progress the plot in this game. It's just by going to bed and going to sleep. Well, or more accurately, by going to lie down in bed and then having a nice conversation between Mardek, Dugan, and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of Mardek and gives him powers. Uh, spoiler alert for chapter one, I guess. But this is chapter two, and so that has already happened, and therefore no one will question it for the entirety of this story. Anyway, we're back at it. Uh, Jacques, our guard leader, says, Well, I don't know. I don't have any more quests for you. So go over to the neighboring town to the east and, I don't know, find something to do? So now we're into the, of course, most exciting part of any RPG, which is wandering around the overworld and getting into fights. Uh, except that we're going to be running from every single random encounter that we can because they take a lot of time. The good news is that in some areas like this one, some of the random encounters are low enough level that you can skip them. Uh, you'll know that they're skippable because this pop-up here will be blue instead of red. Uh, I didn't actually get any in this run, but uh, if it's blue, you can hit Z to skip it. Uh, there's also a bunch of random loot in boxes around here, RPG stuff. Uh, I'm picking up an Earth Rod here, which is a magic wand that lets Emila, our resident spellcaster, cast Earth Magic. Um, this is going to be incredibly useful for the next two fights. If you don't pick it up, I think this run is just kind of forfeit. But, I mean, you can also grind up and Emila will get plenty powerful, but... Making Emila learn all the four magic disciplines is very useful. Ah, yes, because this game has uh, elemental weaknesses, you see. So, earth magic is very strong against water, and water is strong against fire, and fire is strong against air, and air is strong against earth. In the way that makes absolutely no sense, but don't worry about it, it's a video game. Other than the random encounters, there's of course a lot of plot that's happening here. Uh, this game is very polite in that you can hold Z and uh, all the plot will auto-advance. This is related to the fact that holding Z and mashing X will cause cutscenes to break. Uh, X is how you advance a single frame of dialogue, Z is how you auto-advance. If you do both on the same frame, the game gets very confused. Uh, we meet here Eloine, who is a minor plot character uh, who gives us a side quest. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of inventory management and make sure our party can breathe underwater. Uh, suspiciously, but not discussed in this game, uh, Emila knows a spell called Aqualung that lets us all breathe underwater. So, things I did there in the menu. I gave Emila the Earth Rod, and I also gave Emila a shield, Mardek's shield to be precise. Uh, Mardek is not going to be doing much for the rest of the game. His, his days of melee combat are mostly over. Um, so Emila having a little bit more defense, and again, it's not the shield, it's the physical defense reaction, the minus 10% damage reaction, that's really going to help here. Essentially, I just gave Emila plus 10% health, which I think is about like 10 to 15 extra hit points, in about two seconds. So, worth the time investment. Um, Emila is going to be our main damage dealer for pretty much the rest of the mid game. Making sure she doesn't get randomly murdered is good. Other than that, um, I did pick up an ether there. Um, it's a 300 gold item to sell, and we will be doing a little bit of shopping right after this. Uh, there's just sort of nowhere else to get money from in the early game. And we come up upon this boss here. Um, Lake Hag is a water type. You can see that next to her name in the top left. It, her, it's, I don't know. I assume it's a woman, I don't know. I have no reason to assume that. I think it's the lips that make me think that. All the characters have types. Marduk is light, Dugan is earth, Emila is water. Um, so Dugan technically takes um, reduced damage by half, I think, because of his type. I don't know. This is one of the first fights you can see where we're kind of under level. Lake Hag is level 9, my party is level 4 and 5. Um, and as a result, my party is going to get kind of beaten up here. But Mardek has enough MP, that blue bar in the bottom right, to just kind of heal whatever Lake Hag dishes out. One of the reasons I gave Emila the shield is it makes a couple of opportunities where I can let Emila take a hit, like this hit, and not heal her. 
Um, and then Marduk can get an extra sword swing, which sometimes saves the extra round. Uh, it turned out Dugan missed too many times in this fight, but in theory, if Dugan hits all of his attacks, this hit here will kill, or maybe Dugan's melee will kill. Um, instead, I'm going to skip their turns. It's a little faster than watching the animation, because I know Emila deals enough damage to get the kill here. Um, that was, I think, a seven-round fight, and I'm aiming for six, but good enough. Anyway, this was our side quest. We went downstairs, down in the ocean, to fight Lake Hag, because uh, Eloine said her parents got turned to ice, and maybe this will help. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't. So we come back up, and we say, well, we killed Lake Hag, and sorry your parents are still dead. She just kind of runs off crying. Anyway, now we're in Canonia, and we get accosted by Vern, who is this paladin man, and we're going to ignore him and go to a shop. We're going to buy a fancy new sword for Dugan. The ether and the water rod that we're not going to use anymore, because Emil is an earth mage now. Um, and then we're going to run over to this guard captain. Uh, he's going to give us a quest to go to the south and fight some eldritch horror. I don't know. Uh, we're going to talk to Eloine, whose parents we didn't save, but she says thank you anyways and gives us this incredibly helpful magic item. It lets Marduk cast shield on party members, which is really, really helpful. Um, so we're going to sell it for 2,000 gold and buy four Phoenix Downs instead. Phoenix Downs, as I mentioned, like Final Fantasy, let you revive your party members. Um, we're going to do a little bit of inventory management here, just kind of shuffle everyone's inventory around. In particular, we want the Phoenix Downs first in their inventory. Um, and we're also going to buy Dugan some potions. Oh, and I think we gave Dugan the sword as well. Um, the sword gives Dugan a secondary ability. Um, so you saw that he had power attack before. That's just something he knows how to do. He learned it in chapter one. Um, all the different items, right? You saw that like Emila got an earth rod that lets her cast earth magic. Um, Dugan's sword lets him cast a special ability. It's one of his, I don't know, fighter techs. I forget what his, his class of magic is called. Uh, it lets him use an ability called shield break. Um, I mentioned physical shield a couple of times. Physical shield is a status effect that a character friendly or enemy can get. It means they take 50% damage from physical attacks. Since Emila is the only really good spellcaster in the party, oh, no, do need to talk to Vern. He joins our party with 10 health. He nearly got killed. Um, since Emila is the main, really the only main spellcaster, everyone else is going to be doing physical damage. We need to make sure that enemies aren't shielded. In particular, this next fight coming up is really important for that. <coughs> You might see that the party nearly got killed there, but actually they didn't nearly get killed because Emila still has full health. So they're all fine. As long as you run from a battle successfully, all your party comes back with one health. This is the main reason why I just don't have to think about combat in this game. Unless something really catastrophic happens, your party's basically just going to survive. Okay. We're coming up here to a really scary fight. So I mentioned we were underleveled for the last fight, World Save uh, Lake Hag. We're also criminally underleveled for this fight, World Saviors, and this is a 4v4. This is actually one of the most difficult fights in the game, even casually. Um, you're fighting up against another team of adventurers. They've got the same uh, healer, fighter, wizard, tank, I don't know. They also have a party of four. Um, this fight's super, super tricky. I'm going to do pretty much the start of this in a very scripted way. I'm going to have one round of damage to Alia, who's the party healer. Then I'm going to put a round and a half of damage into Bernard. If you look at the um, the party level, the enemy levels across the top, um, you can see that Bernard is level 11. He absolutely murders some fools. Um, this fight goes a little off the rails to start with. You'll notice a couple of party members get KO'd, but fortunately it's the right party members. And as a result, I have just enough time to revive them before it's their turn. Um, and then they're still able to do their attacks. We kill Bernard in round one, basically. Round one and a half. So like midway through round two, this is super important. Again, Bernard deals massive AOE damage. He's super dangerous to fight. After that, we're gonna kill Alia, who's the party healer. She also puts shields and or magic shields on people. Super dangerous. After that, it's not super critical, but we kill uh, Bartholio first. He's the tank. It does take a little longer, but if you kill Venny first, Bartholio will go into a Berserk Rage, which deals double damage, and you really don't want to fight him when he's angry. 
But as you can see here, this is kind of what the characters are going to be doing. We've got Marduk as the healer. We've got Emla dealing some pretty solid magic damage. We've got Dugan as a utility role. You can see here he's making use of this barrier break ability to remove enemy shields or heal people or throw phoenix downs. Um, and Vern is our main melee damage dealer. Um, in particular, Vern, uh, as opposed to Zack, who's the other party member you can pick up in this uh, playthrough, deals really good damage against um, undead enemies, and we are going to be fighting a lot of them. That crit there was a little unfortunate. Um, I'm trying to keep Bartholio at 130 health. Uh, much like the Muriance fight, there are heal thresholds here. Venny, as you just saw, has potions. They're only 100 health this time, not 500. Um, but keeping Bartholio above 130 until Ven after Venny goes gives me a little bit of time to play with to try and knock him out without having to basically fight against bonus health. That was a slight mistake there. I should have had Dugan attack Venny, because I know that um, Vern will always deal 70 to 80 damage, which is enough for a kill. At any rate, some, some small mismanagement in this fight. This wasn't the cleanest, but as you saw from the very beginning, party members can get KO'd very easily when there's four enemies. Um, that is usually where the fight goes wrong, is at that very beginning, you just start losing people like crazy and you can't get back on track. In particular, if you don't kill Bernard round two and Alia round three, it's very likely that Bernard will do too much damage for you to heal back, or that Alia will heal the party too much for you to, or shield the party too much for you to actually get any relevant kills. But we made it through. Everything is wonderful. I mean, our party is half dead, but it doesn't matter because there's a heal crystal here. Um, and we're going to pull off that trick I mentioned earlier at Muriant. So we're going to hold Z and mash X. And I didn't get it the first time, so I actually have to close and reopen the Flash Player. Unlike a web browser, I can't just refresh the page, but it's pretty fast. Hold Z and mash X, and that's going to let us interact with this skull here that's actually a chest that contains a Geo Jacket. I'll talk about that in a little bit. This fight, the Shaman is an undead character, Zombie Canonia Shaman. Undead characters take bonus damage from Phoenix Downs, or from Smite Evil. We're going to use two of our Phoenix Downs there, sometimes it takes three, hopefully it takes two, and we're just going to straight up murder what is a reasonably high level enemy. And having seen how powerful those are, we're now going to head right back to the magic shop and we're just going to buy a bunch more of those. The Geo Jacket there, you're supposed to have to go all the way through the dungeon again. By skipping it, we very quickly get access to a lot of money that we're not really supposed to have. Um, I'm doing a little bit of bad management here, but uh, we're going to just distribute a bunch of the Phoenix Downs and we're going to move the Holy Light from Vern. Vern, or Holy Water? Vern comes in with liquid light whatever this consumable item that cures zombification uh, which happens to be incredibly convenient anyway we come back to our hometown it's been taken over by zombies uh, we talk to the local priest he says uh, did you notice the town's been taken over by zombies here's a key to the sewers I'm pretty sure the necromancers down there go murder him okay the sewers, it's actually kind of neat. The sewers, uh, the area we passed through at the beginning there, there was very briefly, you might have heard the ding, um, uh, one of those blue alert balloon pop-ups for a skippable fight. I was mashing Z the entire time, it immediately skipped. Uh, that is in fact a copy-paste of exactly the same area in Zone 1. Uh, or sorry, in Chapter 1. Uh, except the door is locked in Chapter 1. So getting the key there is, is a nice continuity nod. Um, unfortunately, Emila got poisoned. I haven't talked about it too much, but you may notice that Emila is the character who's always acting in these fights. Emila is also always acting first. Every party member has a lot of stats. One of those stats is agility, which essentially determines your initiative in the party order. There's also a little bar across the top of the screen that's, of course, only very briefly visible because I've memorized the party order, but it would explain if you were playing casually who's got the next turn. Um, because Emila is poisoned, she will always take damage at the start of her turn. It's 5% of maximum health, and she eventually just gets KO'd from it. Uh, fortunately, nothing too bad came of that, because I got to flee the battle with the next Faxis character. She gets revived with one health, and now everything's fine again. But it was a bit of a time loss to have her taking the poison damage, because there's an animation. Okay. 
There is a lot to talk about in this game, and I have been playing this game for a while, and so I want to talk about all of it. Um, we are now in the catacombs. Uh, this is a bit of a maze, uh, this map, and in particular, this map has invisible passages. Um, the only way you can see them is on your map screen. Uh, I'm obviously not checking it, but if you go into the pause menu, there is a built-in map. It's very nice. You get saved with your save file so that, you know, if you discover Fog of War stuff, it goes away. Um, there's also a bunch of really good loot in this area. Unfortunately, it's all way too far away. Anyway, this is the invisible path we'll be taking. It's directly across from the sign that tells you about Bob's map shop, uh, which is a reminder to check your in-game map because this passage will be right right visible on screen uh, as you do so. We're going to take a heal here. We took some random encounter damage. Um, I'm not making saves here. If this is a marathon run, I definitely would. Uh, certainly, when I was starting out, I every single spot that I was healing here, I would just do a full save. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, relatively confident in my play, and of course I can just reset at this point. Um, most of the random encounters, especially in the catacombs, won't hurt you. It really is the poison rats in the sewers that get the most damage marked. Anyways, we're coming up to the zombie locksmith here, uh, who has a really important key for us, because of course he's a locksmith, he has keys, that's how that works. Um, and because he's a zombie, we are going to defeat him by throwing phoenix downs at him. Each phoenix down deals from 100 to 999 damage, so any roll over 550 is above average. Um, I obviously have no control over that, but I will be doing my best to not use up too many extra phoenix downs. Um, there is enough in this route uh, with maybe a couple of spares. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention. Right there, very quick, you might have missed it. I got the Keyblade. It's a random drop from the zombie locksmith, 50% chance. I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, budgeting phoenix downs. Uh, there's There are enough in the route, but it's tight. You have to get like average luck, basically, across the run. Um, if you don't, uh, in particular, if you run out at the zombie Canonia Shaman because you need too many in the World Saviors fight, you can talk to the guard captain again to get a thousand gold, um, which is two more Phoenix downs. Right there, I just picked up an item called the Bone Stone. What that does is it provides an ability called Clarity. Clarity means uh, you cannot, you are immune to zombification. Uh, you may have noticed a trend here. Uh, people are going to be getting turned into zombies. In fact very soon people are going to be getting turned into zombies and so we've got an item that means that if someone gets turned into a zombie instead they come back with full health and not as a zombie and we've got consumables that can be thrown at someone because of course that's how you use potions in an rpg that turn someone from a zombie back into a human both of these are going to be incredibly useful uh in basically the next two really large boss fights this is a mini boss though it's a zombie warrior Guess what we're going to do? We're going to throw Phoenix Downs at him. The important thing I'm doing here um, that you can't hear because, of course, I have the past me muted is I'm counting the number of Phoenix Downs that are left on each character. Um, I've got a little bit of time after this to do menuing. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, so here as well, that was a mistake, but uh, Vern's attack is going to deal enough damage to knock out the Zombie Warrior. Uh, as well his uh, special attack, the one that does uh, smite undead, the one that does bonus damage versus undead, deals about 150 damage. Definitely would have killed there. So attacking with Dugan was a mistake. Uh, Z is the skip character turn uh, button. At any rate, one down. I think I've got like a total of four Phoenix downs left, and I'm trying to think about how I want to budget them. No, I think it was three, and this guy is an average of a 4.5. So I was thinking, like, oh, I need to move the two from Vern onto someone else. My, my suspicion is that I mismanaged uh, the distribution of Phoenix Downs after the Zombie Canonia Shaman. Um, I think probably on average Vern needs one less than I give him um, because he has the Smite Evil attack, uh, which is going to deal pretty good damage. There are a couple of moments in the run that you need to do sort of counting while you do the fight. Um, it really is just going to be the World Saviors fight and that zombie warrior fight that it's really critical. 
most other moments you can get by with just checking your inventory later, but those are moments where it's kind of important to be not losing too much time. Anyway, here we're going to equip, uh, oops, I was on the wrong character. We equip the Bone Stone to Dugan. We're going to give Mardek the sword. We're going to redistribute those Phoenix Downs poorly because I didn't remember what I was doing. Um, and that is all. Um, briefly about that sword. Uh, there are not a lot of good swords for Mardek in this game that are easy to get to. That sword is, in fact, the only one that doesn't cost over a minute. Uh, so getting it from that random drop is pretty much critical for this next random encounter. Uh, Mardek rolled low there, which really stinks. Uh, fortunately, Emola can deal some damage. Uh, I did correctly skip Dugan that time. And then, oh, Vern deals 300 damage, excuse me. And then KO the Zombie Warrior. Uh, that did use all of my Phoenix Downs. And in particular, it used two of Vern's Smite Evils, which is going to be critical for this next fight. This is the first, I guess, second major boss fight, if World Saviors is the first one. Um, Morik here is super dangerous. Again, we're really underleveled. Morik is level 22. We're only barely the party level of all of the enemies. Fortunately, we can dispatch of Morik's shield. Also fortunately, Morik is Earth-type. Emila, from whatever past experience in Chapter 1, has mastered the lightning attack and does not need any particular magic wand to use it, and that will deal the plus, uh, I think, 100% damage to Morik. Um, this is a melee fight, so I start by having Mardek KO the front enemy, healing deals damage against undead types, to just make the menuing a bit faster. Now every character can mash through their attacks. One thing you may have noticed here is that Morik likes the Zombify our team. Um, that's what all the anti-zombie measures are for. Um, in particular, Morik likes to Zombify our team so much that if one of the members of the party is dead, he will always use Zombify rather than any other ability. Why does that matter? One of Morik's abilities is called Arcane Cataclysm. It's a mass AoE against the entire party that deals spirit damage, something that no one in our party is resilient to. After a few rounds of combat, especially if you've all taken some damage, it has a very high likelihood of just wiping the party. Here's that holy water coming into effect for when it's not uh, Dugan who gets killed. So by letting my party die and having Morik revive them, it dramatically reduces the chances of me getting um, absolutely massacred by Arcane Cataclysm. It also saves me a bunch of time that I would otherwise be spending healing my party because Morik will heal them for me. The disadvantage, of course, being that I need to spend a bunch of rounds de-zombifying my party. But Dugan doesn't deal a tremendous amount of damage anyways, so it's fine. Um, now that we've reached sort of the late phase of the boss fight where I can see the end is in sight, Excuse me. I'm having uh, Marduk and Dugan and Co. actually defend against the attacks so that they have some amount of health for the last couple of enemies. Dugan was alive for the Morik kill, so it doesn't matter too much if he gets KO'd here. Um, and this is just a small bit of cleanup. Marduk probably could have finished that enemy. It would have saved me a little bit of time. It's okay. I know Vern will get the kill here, but unfortunately, because I used those two smite evils uh, on the second zombie warrior, I didn't have the MP to use it here. But all in all, a Morik fight where you don't party wipe is a pretty good Morik fight. I lost 30 seconds, which was not great, uh, but it was a reasonable looking fight. And of course, now to progress the plot, we are going to go to sleep again. Uh, which is fair, but like also that was a lot of stuff to do in a day. And once again, the three of us, Marduk Dugan and being of light who lives in Marduk's body rent-free, uh, are going to have a conversation. And we wake up and everyone is here somehow. Don't question it. They just let everyone into Marduk's room for some reason. Um, they tell us that something really bad has happened. Namely, there's a giant spaceship floating over the other city. We say, that's lovely. Go talk to the priest, he gives us an amulet. Um, go to the potion shop and give this man more money than he's ever seen in his life. 
<laughs> Fortunately, he has an infinite number of Phoenix Downs. Um, we're going to sell that nice sword we got from our deck because uh, for the rest of the game, nobody's going to be dealing any melee damage. Pretty much. Um, we're pretty much just going to be relying on the power of Phoenix Downs for the rest of the game. Uh, fortunately, the king gives us money. We have the amulet to sell. And we have a Phoenix Pinion that drops from Morik, which is a 5,000 gold item. Um, the sword is nice. It's two extra Phoenix Downs. It's not technically necessary. I did get a little boned by the zombies. They spawn randomly, and they can block that little thin passageway to the right, which is a slightly faster walking route. But fighting them, and you actually have to kill them for the random encounters to go away, takes way too long. All right. All that said, we're at the point of no return. We're now on Morik's spaceship. Uh, this is a super scary area, because once again, we're amazingly underleveled. The enemies are like level 13, 12. Um, we're going to grab a couple more Phoenix Downs, if I can remember how to menu. Um, I've been talking about random encounters a little bit. I do want to mention, um, for most of the game, random encounters have been skippable, right? I run from all of them. At the end of this sequence, there's going to be a moment where random encounters stop being skippable. And it becomes incredibly important that we can defeat them quickly and get as few of them as possible. The way random encounters work in this game is that there is a sort of step counter since your last random encounter. It counts up to 150, at which point you get a guaranteed random encounter. As it counts up, the chance of a random encounter increases linearly. Generally speaking, in this area, you'll get a random encounter about every 50 steps. So, as a result, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to save the game and close the emulator because this piece of information, the number of steps since your last encounter, is actually saved in global memory, not in your save file. So by restarting the game, it goes down to zero. Uh, steps here, there are no random encounters in this area, and boss fights do not impact this number. All right, second to last boss of the game, the Dreyslon. Uh, we're gonna throw Phoenix Downs at it, because it's undead. Uh, this boss actually has the most health of any boss in the game, I think including the secret bosses. Um, yeah, but we got some really incredible rolls here. I think this was two and a half rounds, like 10 Phoenix Downs, which is very above average, or below average, whatever, very fast. Uh, in particular, uh, the Dreyslon didn't cast any AoE spells. We only took damage on one party member. As you can see, this was very close to gold. Only reason it wasn't was probably random encounter luck. We get a second bone stone here, which is really nice because, uh, surprise, surprise, we're gonna fight up against Morg again. He's gonna turn more people into undead zombies. Uh, similarly, therefore, we don't need to heal the party, but we do wanna cure numbness from Dugan just so that he can do things. That might have not even been necessary, I don't know. Um, I will mention, I tried out a slightly different strat here. The traditional strat was to throw Phoenix Downs at Morik just until he died. Um, again, he's got physical shield, magic shield, you can't really deal him damage traditional ways. Uh, and then deal with the drama. In While I was doing runs, I looked at the game code again, and it seems like he doesn't resurrect his drama unless they're all dead. Which means that it's probably slightly faster to take out two of the Droma and then, uh, while you're working on Morik, because then there'll be fewer enemy rounds to go through while you wail on the boss. It's probably not tremendously faster, but I think it saves probably five to ten seconds in the fight. Um, just sort of flat, and of course it saves you a bit of like taking a bunch of damage. Um, I screwed up the count here. Um, this Droma does not die when I hit it. I think you want Emila to do two mass AoEs. As a result, the Droma heals, which means I just wasted two rounds of combat there, uh, which is pretty much useless. At any rate, uh, Morik this time around has haste, which means he just straight up murders someone and then straight up brings them back as a zombie. That's just going to happen constantly. Unfortunately, um, we got an off timing here, and so he brought back Emila after her turn, and so she actually missed her turn. Uh, one of the things that contributed to this fight being slow. Once you get Morik down to a low enough health, uh, the Droma will heal him. I think it's like 13 or 1400 health, but we just kind of straight up murder him here. Um, and now we have to deal with the Droma, and unfortunately my party is a little low on health here. 
Um, the good news is that uh, Marduk isn't really a damage dealer. The bad news is that Vern is. Uh, but once again, Emila is a really, really competent uh, magic dealer. So I'm going to use one of those Phoenix Downs I was throwing to bring Marduk back. Just so we can heal here and make sure the party's totally safe. If you die here, it is game over. If you die during any of these fights, it's game over. It was probably faster to have Dugan pass here. Um, given that I know Emil is going to get the kill, but Vern was able to get the kill, so it worked out to be about the same. Alright, all in all, not too terrible of a zombie morgue fight. Now, uh, some plot happens that I won't go into, but the short answer is that the self-destruct button gets pushed. We're not going to name names. And as a result, we're now fleeing for our lives. Uh, the uh, worst news is that, of course, now all the random encounters are not skippable. You cannot run from them anymore. So that step counter thing I was talking about before matters. Um, this is about 135 steps to get to the exit. Uh, it's, I think, an 8% chance of getting one encounter. Uh, something like a 30% chance of getting two encounters and something like a 45% chance of getting three encounters. But as you can see, each encounter is pretty long. This is actually the fastest encounter you can get. Uh, the only one security orb is basically the best. You can kill it in one round. And then you've got the zombies who you can pretty handily deal with in round two. Um, so all in all, this is an incredibly fast fight. Um, if you take a look at the times, you can see that uh, Record was actually considerably... Or if you took a look at the times, you would see that Record was considerably behind my PB at the Zombie Morik fight, but then caught up during the final sequence. That's because Record got a one single encounter escape sequence. I got incredibly lucky during this run to also hit a single encounter escape sequence. And that is the reason why this run is really, really fast. As I said, 8% chance. Does not happen every time. So, Dugan nobly sacrifices himself for some reason to save the party. Um, the spaceship self-destructs. We find ourselves back in our hometown. So, oh, the king tells us we did a great job. Uh, that's important. We get a kiss. Um, and then we go to sleep because that's how you progress the plot in this game. Except now, of course, there's only one of us and our uh, immortal soul, I guess, to talk to. Uh, we're going to get a brief view here of the Governance to Magi, uh, the sort of evil group who are behind everything. Uh, and then that's time. Uh, this is, by the way, the best escape sequence I've ever had. Uh, I've never actually had a one encounter before. So that was really good. Well... I hope that was not too much of an info dump, but um, thank you for watching. I do really like this game, uh, even if it definitely shows its age. I did have a lot of fun running it again. Uh, as I said the last time I got a PV, I'm probably not going to run this again. 